Thank you, Clay. That was lovely. Um, one of my uh, nicest qualities is that I can't quote myself, so uh, uh, I thank you for doing it. And I'd like to thank also Mrs. Vickers and Dr. Vickers. It's, it's uh, truly a privilege, not to mention an adventure, to be taking part in this conference. From the first time I heard that, your, that Dickinson had plans to hold a symposium on Theodore Roosevelt, the adventurer, I thought it was a brilliant idea. And as we've already seen from the speakers we've heard so far, uh, the brilliant idea has been turned into a brilliant reality. I, ho I really hope that all of you are enjoying yourselves as much as I am. The reason that I think a conference on Theodore Roosevelt, the adventurer, is a brilliant idea is that TR's sense of adventure was one of his most characteristic characteristics. Also, the subject of his is one that few of us really, that few of us pause to consider at any length. These three days are a wonderful opportunity to do that, and my guess is that they'll leave us thinking about how to make our own lives more adventurous. I don't know about you, but I take history and biography personally. I don't just want to learn the facts and the ideas when I read a history or a biography. I want to learn something about human nature and human experience and to build what I learn into my own life and especially into my relations with other people. I'm going to talk mostly about TR on safari, but before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to write a book focused on this period in, in TR's life, the last 10 years of his life. I was in this book about Henry Adams and his friends called The Five of Hearts, and they're a generation older than Theodore Roosevelt. And he comes in and out of the book in kind of, as kind of a cameo character, and they treat him rather uh, comically. Um, they don't take him all that seriously. Um, their letters are full of humorous remarks about him. And one thing that stayed in my mind uh, from, it was like 15 years between the time that book was published and this book was published, and all that time, I kept thinking that this man was only 50 when he left the White House. He loved being president. He loved having power. He was a good president. He's at the top of his game, and all of a sudden, it's over. So I wondered, what would happen to a man like that, a man who loved power once he didn't have it anymore? So this book is really my answer to that question. TR gave a multitude of meanings to adventure. In the words to encompass everything from a hike in the woods to hunting trips to life itself. The summer before last, I drove around the parts of northern France where the American Expeditionary Force of World War I, which included all four of his sons and one of his two sons-in-law, did most of its fighting. And one of the things I sought out was the monument that the Roosevelt family put up in memory of TR's youngest son, Quentin, whose plane was shot down in a field nearby. The monument's sarcophagus-like structure of stone, and it has a big water basin fed by a spout. Like many of the memorials put up in France after the war, it was meant both to honor the war dead and to serve some useful function. This one was intended for the local livestock. The inscription on the sarcophagus is from T.R.'s book, The Great Adventure, and he said he had Quentin in mind when he wrote it. Only those are fit to live who do not fear to die, and none of I who have shrunk from the joy of life and the duty of life. The joy of life and the duty of life, and the courage to embrace both. That was TR's notion of the supreme adventure. When you think about presidential style, adventurous is definitely a word that comes to mind. Other words would be energetic and active, and I think his accomplishments as president put him right up there with the other men whose faces look out from that presidential monument in my second favorite, Dakota. But for me, the word that best defines his presidency is not adventure, it's enlargement. He enlarged the role of the federal government in American life, using its power as a counterweight to the power of the industrial and financial that sprung up in the last part of the 19th century. He enlarged the power of the presidency and like every successful occupant of the White House, he enlarged himself. As his future nemesis, Woodrow Wilson, put it, the president 
liberty, both in law and in conscience, to be as big a man as he can. His capacity will set the limit. But in spite of all that T.R. achieved as president, and in spite of the fact that he loved being president, he occasionally chafed at the of the office. Who wouldn't? It's fascinating to watch him during his last year in the White House. He kind of seesaws between wringing every last drop of enjoyment out of the place and throwing himself wholeheartedly into the preparations for a grand adventure, his year-long safari in Africa, a trip that he regarded as his reward for two and a half years of very hard work as a public servant. So on the one hand, you see him in his letters doing things to make that last year as memorable as possible, like taking his census on the White House grounds, for example, or making sure that he invites this or that friend for one more meal in the White House. And on the other hand, you see him carrying on an amazingly voluminous correspondence in connection with the safari. His English friends and friends of his English are connecting him with their friends in British East Africa, and they write back extending invitations and answering his questions about hunting and giving him all kinds of, ad of practical advice. Be sure to have leather patches sewn on the knees of your trousers because the grasses can knife sharp. Get boots with thick rubber soles because they make no noise when you're sneaking up on game. He was also advised to take plenty of jam because many safari goers had experienced surprisingly strong cravings for sweets when they were out in the bush. Somebody told him to order up plenty of lard and beef fat too for cooking the lean antelope and gazelles that would be served for dinner most nights. People sent him all kinds of things to take along on the trip. John L. Sullivan, the prize fighter, sent him a rabbit's foot for good luck. And an American dentist who knew that stringy meat has a tendency to get caught in between the teeth sent TR a supply of dental floss. The letters about guns and ammunition going to and from the White House in 1908 would fill a small book. And when it came to tents, Frederick Sellis, an English sportsman celebrated for his African hunting exploits, recommended one of green waterproof canvas with a small compartment tacked on at the back for a bathroom. It also had a sort of canvas veranda out front for dining and writing. It sounded so T.R. said that it made him feel a little effeminate. You can see how that would not go down well with him. Not at all like his Dakota days, he wrote Sellis. Back then he had slept on a tarp under the stars. He agreed to the luxurious tent line at Real China. Simple aluminum or, or enamel wear would do for him, he said. The most famous thing T.R. took on the safari was his pigskin library. With a birthday check from one of his sisters, he ordered up a long list of books in compact editions and then asked his book dealer to have them taken apart and trimmed at the margins and then rebound in pigskin. He wanted the pigskin because he knew that regular cloth and board book covers wouldn't hold up as the books were bounced around in the bush. He also booked dealer to have an aluminum bookcase for this custom design, uh, make an aluminum bookcase for this custom design traveling library. The case was surprisingly small, just a little over two feet tall, less than a foot wide, and only about a few inches deep. Still, it was big enough for almost 60 volumes. And by law, the largest load a safari porter could carry was 60 pounds, so the library had to be brought in at something less than that. And it weighed in once it was slipped into its oilskin case at pounds. TR's sense of adventure was intellectual as well as physical and political. His curiosity and his knowledge had enormous range, which you can see in the pigskin library. For his trip, he wanted books that took time to ingest, he said, the works of great author and Milton. There were a few medieval classics, a few English romantic poets, and three volumes containing the complete works of Shakespeare. Up to that point, he hadn't really enjoyed Shakespeare because he didn't care for drama written in verse, but for safari purposes, he regarded Shakespeare as a kind of emergency ration, the largest amount of sustenance in the smallest possible space, he said. He took along a bit of history, and for fun, there was fiction. Bret Hart, Mark Twain, James Fenimore Moore Cooper, Sir Walter Scott, Thackeray, and Dickens. T.R. could hold his own against a battalion of English professors in any poetry quoting contest, and most of the books in the pigskin library he had read before, some of them more than once. His excitement about the safari comes through in his letters again and again. He could just hardly wait for that trip to start. Six months before he leaves the White House, he's writing one of his hosts out there, by George, I am red hot to get out now. 
And can't you just hear him say that? Maybe, maybe Clay will deliver that line in his best Rooseveltian manner later on. He was eager for the adventure and eager to get past the dull presidential campaign then underway. His hand-picked successor, William Howard Taft, was a thoroughly lovable fellow but a dud on the campaign trail. Taft's opponent, William Jennings Bryan, had more spark, but the two of them were arguing about who would be the better steward of the progressive legacy begun by TR. The voters went with TR's pick. TR originally conceived of the safari as a relatively straightforward hunting trip with his son Kermit. But as his plans took shape, they grew larger and larger. Why not make it a scientific expedition as well and take along some naturalists from the Smithsonian, he wondered. And why not pay for it by writing magazine pieces as he went? And wouldn't it be a good idea to stay away so that Taft could have the stage all to himself and become president in his own way? TR paid his expenses and Kermit's, but he persuaded the Smithsonian to sponsor the trip and fund the work of three naturalists with money from private donors. Scribner's, a classy month published, that published the likes of Henry James and Edith Wharton, offered to him a whopping $50,000 for a dozen articles, which would be published first in the magazine and then as a book. 